Welcome everyone. The following is an excerpt from my lecture on Fichte, which is part of my course on German idealism. So I'm going to read a short excerpt on the self-positing I, the transcendental ego in Fichte that posits itself. And I begin with the question that what it is that begins to show itself with Hume, which is the breakdown of the unity of being and thought. That is not primarily, I say, the denial of the external world as it's so often taken, when we understand this epistemologically. Or, you know, so the external world, its regularity, etc., or even the existence of others. This is not what I think Hume's skepticism would point us to. But more fundamentally, the split or collapse of the union and marriage between being and thinking. That's to say, there is a total loss of trust within thinking in itself, of which the denial of the external world is only an expression, but not its core. And before I continue, if you'd like to study German idealism more closely with me in this in-depth course, then please just follow the link in the description of this video. And also you'll find many links down there by which you can support my work here on this channel. Nihilism is not simply the denial of the world. Nihilism at its dark core is the complete direction of being and thinking, the uprooting of human being, the desertification of logos, which the human being is. Hence, this battle is fought on the level of logic, which is not exhausted by formalisms, but as Hegel will say after Fichte, we are living concept, breathing idea. We are the breathing idea. To be trapped, as Frederick Beiser points out, in a place where the skeptical subject after Hume is trapped again, quote, inside the circle of its own consciousness, knowing nothing more than its representations. That's the threat. Beiser concludes Fichte had discovered the horrors of nihilism. It's a wonderful remark by Frederick Beiser in his book on Trimethialism. Indeed so. For what is nihilism? The crisis of all crises. But the collapse of the trust of the human being in thinking itself, that's what nihilism is, is, I think. The denial of the external world is but a result of this. The entrapment of the subject within itself is the result of the collapse of the union of thinking and being. What is required, therefore, is the depiction of unity, or the return is, is, is to, well, to depict the unity, to, to force, you could almost say, being and thinking back together. As the Wissenschaftslehre from 1804 states, quote from Fichte, the task of philosophy can also be expressed as follows. Depiction of the absolute. The I that posits itself is the absolute unconditioned and self-evident principle, one of unity in addition, which accompanies all experience and which hence guarantees absolute unity of what is. Again, this is not a private I or self, not an ego in that sense, not personal, not psychological, but logical, and that is to say, related to Logos. Not the Logos itself, but it's the homologane. It's speaking out of Logos. I am I is the Grundsatz, Ich bin Ich, the Grundsatz of this thought. Grundsatz, of course, means principle and translation. Not only according to the dictionary, but also philosophically. Yet, one can hear also something else here, which is this in the German word, the ground that posits Grundsatz. More precisely, the ground that posits itself in the act of positing itself. This stressing of the activity of the I and the thought is pivotal. For Fichte, philosophy can only be thought in actu, never is fixed dogma. Hence, the positing of the I should not be understood as a fixed, permanent, or substantial ground. Instead, the I is only through that very self-positing. It is not without this self-positing. Fichte has also rewrote his Wissenschaftslehre every year. This is also an act, a practice, and an achievement of Gedächtnis, of recollection. The human being becomes an individual only through the performance and achievement of one's recollection which is not some container of data and memory, but only ever in actu, in recollecting itself and so delivering itself over. 
There are certainly pre-echoes of the radical freedom of 20th century extensionism in Fichte insofar as I make myself a reflection, but of course this is, again, this is a logical I and not really an existential I. Quote from Beiser, when I posit myself, I know myself, but I also make or create myself. In self-positing, self-knowing, and self-making are intertwined. I know myself because I make myself, and I make myself because I know myself. But I say this, a, 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 maybe not contra Beiser, but it's quite well to contradict it a bit. It's, again, we are on the plane of transcendental logic here and not psychology or existentialism. So we don't really deal with anyone in particular making him or herself in their respective life world. That's not really what's going on um, after a principle of thinking. But anyways, of course, this could spill over into the, the existential realm and the psychological, but it can, it can only spill over. It's not really... Uh, that, that, the question how this comes together is, is something that I can't answer here for now. This always speaks of the transcendental I, never of a personal I. Fichte here attempts to argue against the self as a substance or soul. The I is absolutely active, not permanent ground. The I is the result of its own activity, of its own freedom, which it continues for and by itself. By the way, this is very important that again, even with Fichte, there's a Grundsatzlehre, etc., but the, the ground also posits itself, so it's not a foundationalism. I think this is very, very crucial also, again, if, and I don't think that actually Heidegger says it, but some Heideggerians do, uh, to, to assume that all of metaphysics, so-called, you know, tried to um, have a, find a foundation, and on top of that foundation, built or erected a certain system. So this self-making is not, that's not the case, obviously, right? it's the same as in Hegel's not the case. So this self-making is not personal, but transcendental, that's to say, prior to any experience. Any psychological experience also, yet Fichte's position is not one of crude subjectivism. He struggles against subjectivism. There are other minds for him. There is intersubjectivity. We are in the world practically through our will and actions and an ethical dialogue with others. Self-consciousness, moreover, only arises through being conscious of the external world. Fichte does not claim the absolute I exists, his knowledge of existence can only be derived from possible experience. That is to say, the absolute I is absolutely necessary as a principle of self-positing. But there is no claim made about its ontological status. After Kant, traditional ontology is no longer possible. Fichte goes beyond Kant, in so far as Fichte shows that the transcendental apperception, which remains ungrounded for Kant, is indeed to be derived from and also dependent upon the self-positing I, the form of reflection. Kant does not yet see that the logical positings must be anchored in the self-positing I. More precisely, the categories must be arrived at necessarily. Kant showed their application a priori to the manifold through our perception. Yet it did not show where they necessarily derive from, which is the absolute I. Fichte further develops Kant's strength in philosophy also in that the thing in itself, or things in themselves, no longer plays any role. Kant's concept of appearance requires things in themselves in order to establish a knowledge of domination of phenomena through the positive categories, which do not apply to things in themselves. They are in the noumenal, if you like, you know, their rep representation of a counterfeit. With Fichte's elimination of the thing in itself, the residual ontology lingering in Kant is removed. Say, say the, the, the residual ontology of the thing in itself. And what twists free as a necessary moment in the development of thought is the trace of our self-relation through self-reflection. In Fichte, we find the trajectory of philosophy and especially modern philosophy that awakens to subjectivity. The first full attempt at self-reflection and how we relate to ourselves through the form of reflection. While this is at best hinted at in Descartes and perhaps neglected in Kant, what we see here in Fichte is the arising of human freedom in its logical sense. Hence, for Fichte, we can also determine more broadly the a priori than with Kant. 
The eye posits itself. This is now from Fichte's Grundlagen der gesamten Wissenschaftslehre. The eye posits itself and it is by virtue of this pure act of positing through itself. And vice versa, the I is and it posits its being by virtue of its pure being. It is at once both that which is active and the product of its actions. The active and that which is produced through its activity. Action and deed are one and the same. And the I am is therefore an expression of a fact, act, and a tat, handlung. This is the first Grundsatz. It is absolutely absolute or unconditional. This is not a substance that posits itself though. It is the pure positing of the I, a self-positing. The I is only in so far as it continuously posits itself. That's to say the I is brought about, brings itself about through its positing. Again, it's not a, found, it's not a foundation. The I is its positing of itself. There's a grounding, but it's not foundationalism. The eye is only through this activity. That is to say, the eye does not exist qua substance before it begins to act. The eye is the act. Fichte thinks the eye in actu, its being is to posit itself and hence the eye is at once what is active and what is produced by its own actions. The eye, which is self-positing, is active through its self-positing. But the eye also brings itself about through these self-positings. That is to say, the I is not stable, substantial ground. Hence, this is also not to be conflated with subjectivism. The I is the necessary principle prior to all experience. But note that Fichte sees a unity between being and seeing. That is to say, Fichte wishes to establish again the trust necessary between being, seeing, thinking. To sum up, the I is absolutely and unconditionally free in its, in, in its activity. The transcendental I is its activity. The I is non-representational. There is no object in the world which it represents. It is the source of unity and experience a priori. The, a, the I sorry, posits itself qua form of reflexivity, reflexively and hence freely. To say I am is the expression of the fact act of itself, the fact act of itself, the tat handlung. So a, a handlung, no, an act that makes a fact. As it were. To say I am is to act and to express freedom through activity. To say I am is also synonymous to the identity expressed in I am I. As the I says I am, it posits itself. To say I means to posit and say the positing. We can here also see that for Fichte, freedom entirely excludes necessity. And for Schelling, you will have to think together necessity and freedom. For Fichte, the will is entirely indeterminate, indifferent. There are no causes from without for Fichte on which the I acts, unlike for Kant. This is, however, a hypothesis in the strict sense of the word, as outlined above, the ground, hypo, that is posited, thesis. Hypothesis. That is to say, the I as a postulate of reason, from which all possible propositions can be determined, because the absolute first Grundsatz already contains them freely. Yet, as hypothesis, the I remains a positing. That is to say, here thinking does not get behind its presuppositions. The second Grundsatz of Fichte takes into consideration all that is not the I, all that is opposed to the I, that is to say, the not I. The not I, sorry, this principle is no longer absolutely unconditional, but a conditional according to its content. The not I does not posit itself, but is necessarily in opposition to the I, but not posited by the I. The non I limits the I in and its positings. So we should not conflate the Fichtian eye, for example, with Dostoevsky's description of Satan in Brothers Karamazov, where Lucifer is the absolute subject from which all emanates. That is not the case in Fichte at all, but it is certainly an imminent possibility in modern subjectivism. The absolute I is, however, still the combination of the I and not I and the bridge between subject and object.
The absolute is now no longer located in the dead thing in itself, as Fichte writes in 1804, but in the living, free, active I, which is the bridge, the unity between being and thinking. Even though there is no emanation from the Fichtean absolute I, there still remains a significant shadow of the absolute I, which must posit itself as potentially infinite. The problem is that if the absolute I posits itself, sorry, if the absolute I posits the non-I, and if the absolute I is indeed infinite, then why would not the non-I be consumed by the absolute I and become I? All speaking logically, not existentially. The non-I is introduced as a limitation, but the absolute I could consume it. Thus, the I does not have total power over the non-I, even though the absolute would require absolute power. There is something irreconcilable, it seems here, in Fichte, which he attempts to solve with the notion of striving, streben in Deutsch, right, in German. The I strives ceaselessly, even though the I is now infinite, is now finite. The I strives, as Weiser puts it, infinitely in a, quote, struggle against a hostile world. That is to say, Fichte introduces a striving finite I, which however will infinitely strive to turn the non-I into I. Weiser, I think rightly, points out that this is the Faustian moment of Fichte's thought. The world opposes the I, but the I relentlessly strives against it, trying to transform the world into its image. Hence, also the place of nature is under threat in its, this radical, awakening of human freedom. So there needs to be complete control over nature. Only then will, be, will we be completely free. So you can see the dangerous waters that Fichte got himself into and that we are still in also. Only through controlling nature, by the way, this can be done sustainably. Maybe some, some will understand what I mean. Some, sometimes you just you can just only give hints. You know. Only through controlling nature totally and sustainably can we be absolutely free from all necessity. Nature thus becomes fiction. Her realm disappears. This gives rise to the necessity of Schellings and Hölderlins and Hegel's philosophies of nature. So we can here see also the necessity of dialectics, which however remains underdeveloped in Fichte remains very external or superficial. It's a thesis of this is synthesis. And th the synthesis would be the destruction of nature, <laughs> the consumption of the non-I in the I. Hegel even says that Fichte's dialectics, especially developed in the later editions of the Wissenschaftslehre, is superficial. It would be Hegel's task to elevate dialectical logic to a Wissenschaft itself and do so imminently without a hypothesis, so hence also without presupposition. Fichte does not survive in speculative logic, where thinking can unite within itself opposites. Thank you very much. So, as I said before, if you'd like to study journalism with me more directly in more, in more detail, then follow the link in the description of this video. And also, if you know anyone who might be interested in this, just send the video and if you can do support the channel in any way. Thank you very much indeed.